And we come to this, this, this chapter in chapter 7, and we see they're eaten now. And the Pharisees and the scribes are somewhere around here, and here they come. And we're going to see what they do with tradition and how they try to apply their, apply their traditions to these disciples. So let me start by saying that our man-made traditions often turn into dogmatic opinions. Our man-made traditions often turn into dogmatic opinions. Remember what dogmatism is and what dogmatic means. It means that it is characterized by uh, or given to the expression of an opinion very strongly. Held to as if it's a fact, right? Some of you guys, some of us hold to our opinions as if they're facts. And you know it's not a fact. I know what you're thinking. That's one that we do, right? I know what you're thinking. You don't know what else someone else is thinking. I heard that just this week. I, I know what you're thinking. And the truth is, 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 you know, we don't know what someone else thinks, but, but we think by fact we do. You assume omniscience, don't you? That's a dogmatic opinion, right? And so we're going to see that our man-made traditions oftentimes turn into dogmatic opinions where we begin to hold them as if they were a fact. Now look at verse 1. It says, Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Do you remember where they're at right now? They are at the Sea of Galilee. They're on the shores of Galilee. This tells you that these Pharisees came all the way from Jerusalem. They had journeyed all the way to Galilee to see Jesus. They came all the way. Jesus' name was no doubt already making the headway, and they wanted to examine to see what's going on. And their dogmatic opinions about the way ministry ought to go motivated them to travel from Jerusalem to Galilee. That's pretty serious, huh? This is a day where you didn't just hop in the car and drive for 20 minutes down the road. This is quite a journey because they believe this is the way ministry ought to be done. And, you know, this is it. And this is what our, the tradition of our fathers and our elders have taught us. We've got to go make sure that he's doing this correctly. And so they go to monitor Jesus' ministry. And what do they find? It says in verse 2, Now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Their dogmatic opinion was quick to find fault with anyone who didn't see eye to eye. Isn't that... You identify with that already, don't you? We're quick to find fault with someone who does not see eye to eye. They attempted to ensure here that, that these disciples were washing their hands and, and that, that God's law was kept. What is this? This is a tradition that they have built up a certain ritual of washing that, in which they would keep themselves not only just morally clean, but ceremonially clean. They're watching these guys. What they are doing here is, in the book of Exodus chapter, actually the book of Leviticus, no, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 30, um, chapter, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it's Exodus chapter, uh, ooh, uh, I've, chapter 30, sorry about that. And Exodus chapter 30, verse 19. And actually in the book of Leviticus, you'll find several ritual requirements with which the priests of Israel were required to wash their hands and to go through this cleansing ritual within the temple. Very interesting stuff. Because I, I imagine you guys would probably love to have your devotional time during that. I'm kidding with you. I know none of you probably ever read the book of Leviticus for your devotional, right? That's probably the last book you'll go to. Not Mike Emmerich. Mike Emmerich uh, did it in a week, man. I was proud of him. But um, they had the book of Leviticus actually describes this ritual cleansing that the priestly class had to go through in order to serve at the tabernacle, which was later turned into the temple, correct? This was for the priestly class. It was not for the regular people. What they did was these guys were very specific about how they washed their hands. This is not about hygiene, guys. It's not about hygiene. I mean, if it was just about, yeah, you need to wash your hands, you know, I would say, well, that's probably a good idea, right? But that's not what this is about. This is not, this, disciples are not stupid. It's not like they don't have good hygiene and that they're trying to help them, you know, be a little bit cleaner around the house. 
They're concerned that they don't wash their hands in a very specific way because what had happened by this time was tradition had developed so to, to, to such an extent that they required that your hands had to be washed very specifically or you couldn't worship God and you could not go to the temple. Let me explain how this happened. First of all, the hands had to be free of dirt, sand, and mortar, right? Or any, etc., anything else. It couldn't have any dirt, sand, you know, could, it had to be free of all that stuff before you could even start the ceremonial washing. Do you get that? So that's one washing first. But then the ceremonial washing started. The water for, the, for washing your hands had to be stored in a special stone jar that was used for nothing else but washing. You could not use just any water. This is very specific. They're, these, they're saying that you cannot use just any water. It has to be stored in a specific stone jar that is made just for that ceremonial purpose. And that's it. And if you use water for anything else, then it's not, it doesn't count as hand washing. You can't go out and get the garden hose and just wash your hands. The hands had to be washed in a specific way. First, what had to happen was they had to leave their fingers pointed up. And the water had to be poured on the hands and at least make it down to the wrist. This is all specified in extra laws that they made, called the Talmud. And the Mishnah that was made 200 years after this, after these oral traditions had been recorded. The, hand, the water had to roll down at least to the wrists. They had to use at least a bare minimum of one and one-half eggshells of, of water. While the hands were still wet, they had to grind the fist, each fist into each one, into the other hand. And because that water now in their hand was unclean, now they had to be rinsed. Because they did that, and this water was unclean. So what they would do is, uh, now they would have to actually point their fingers down... And, they're, and they'd have to run water until the water dripped off of their fingertips. Now, to fail to do this was to be unclean in the sight of God, according to these guys. If you did not do that when you ate, it was to fail to be clean in the sight of God, according to these guys. There was traditions that developed that if you didn't do this, you'd be subject to the attack of the demon Shipta. I mean, man, I don't want the demon shipped on my case, right? That's, and that was believed to be the demon of poverty? You're going to have the poverty demon on me, man, if I don't ceremonially wash my hands. I don't want the poverty demon chasing me around. i got enough problems. And a demon of destruction? You could be excommunicated for not washing your hands in the right way. Matter of fact, there's a story of a, of a rabbi who was imprisoned by Rome who was assigned a certain ration of drinking water every day and he almost died of thirst because he refused his ration of water to cleanse his hands and wouldn't drink it because it was unclean. That's how legalistic these guys got. You see, something might be unclean in an ordinary sense, but... It might, it might be clean in, a, in an ordinary sense, but it might be unclean in a legal sense. Uh, look, just let me give you a couple other here. Uh, the, the, a hollow vessel could become unclean from the inside, but not from the outside. So if you had a jar, it could become clean from the inside, but you don't have to worry about it being un, unclean on the outside. If you, it became unclean and it was an earthen vessel, in other words, it made of clay or something, it had to be broken into s such small pieces so that any broken fragment of that pieces could not, hold, uh, could not hold more than enough oil to anoint your little toe. Now, when I'm telling you this, I'm telling you this because this is all recorded in laws that they made. I'm being very specific with you. This is the laws that they made to govern these things. Metal vessels that became unclean had to be boiled and purged with fire and polished. But there were a few exceptions. Doors, doorknobs, knockers didn't have to worry about those things. Now, check this out. Wood that was used in metal vessels could become unclean. But metal used in wood vessels could not become unclean. None of this stuff is in the Bible, guys. All this stuff has been added by tradition over the years and added as they begin to apply things to people that go as never God's intention. These guys, their original command was that all the priests must wash their hands. Well, we're not talking about priests. We're talking about ordinary people here. This is not just simply 
It, it, though this was only, the, only a priest requirement, what happened was all pious Jews began to do this about 200 B.C. And what happened was that the disciples were not accused of not washing their hands, they were accused of not washing them correctly. And this is not simply an ancient problem, is it? This is not just a problem that happened 2,000 years ago, guys. This is a problem that confronts us every day and that we, which we live and that you and I are most likely guilty of even here today. Isn't it? When we develop these extra-biblical traditions and insist that people hold on to them, when we hold our opinions so dogmatically that we will not fellowship with them if they don't do things the way we see that they should, even though our opinion is not necessarily represented in the Bible, Right? We have extra biblical traditions that define what clothes we ought to wear to church. Right? This is interesting to me because um, I've changed over the years. I do, and um, I used to be the guy that I wore, I didn't wear this kind of stuff to church. And, and I imagine some people probably think I started wearing this stuff because I became a pastor. And you know what? That's actually not the truth. I realize that when I wear a tie, there are some people that are going to be alienated because I wear a tie. And I also realize that when I don't wear a tie, there are some people that are going to be alienated because I don't wear a tie. And I realize that I can come up here, like, do you guys remember uh, Nick Benjamin? Love that brother. And if some of you remember, I know a lot of you probably don't because you weren't here when he came around, but Jim's, uh, Nick is this power lifter, right? And he's this big guy. And he always made it insistent coming up and preaching in a pair of sweat shorts and a t-shirt. You know that brother got judged left and right and got stared down. You know what I've wanted to do? But I just don't have one. Maybe someone could help me out. I want a Jesus robe. I want a Jesus robe, man. And I would love to come up here and dress like that and start condemning you and judging you for not wearing my, a Jesus robe. This is what Jesus wore, man. We have these traditions, is my point. Now, the Bible does give us rules on that. I mean, be modest. That's the rule. Be modest. Be modest. Interesting, isn't it? We have extra biblical traditions that define what kind of music can be played in church. It wasn't too long ago that I know of someone who said, you know what, I don't like the songs you're playing because they're not crossroads songs. And we were kind of like, what? What's a crossroads song, man? They're like, well, you know, it's A, B, and C, and they begin to name a list, and I was like, hello, no. At least that's what I was thinking. That's a tradition. That's not in the Bible. I know that there's wisdom that must be exercised in these things, and I understand that. But I find that when I try to adopt a fad to please one person, I immediately alienate someone else. So I've adopted the opinion, I'm just going to be me, and I'm going to preach the Word of God. That's it. By the way, you know why I started dressing like this? I did this Ancestry.com thing. I've seen some of my ancestors, and I don't know what it was, but I've seen some of my grandfathers I've never seen before. I was like, that's my blood. Well, that's kind of cool. I think I, it kind of helped. I don't know. I thought they were cool, so I started dressing like them. <laughs> that's the only reason. And music. I'll be honest, I love all kinds of music. I do. You know, funny, I, I've confessed this before. You know, I remember a time in my life when I walked away from the church and I hated hymns because I got tired of singing the same ones over and over again. And I once I walked away, I didn't leave the church, but I moved out of town. And um, a year later, you know what? The Lord played this trick on me. I started whistling hymns. I didn't know why. I was thinking, well, music ought to be this way. And the Lord really taught me some lessons. You know what? Just worship me. If you're hung up on that... Just worship me. 